Today's episode of the Inside EVs podcast is brought to you by E-Range EV Tire. E-Range EV Tires are specifically engineered for electric vehicles. Using an advanced manufacturing process called liquid phase mixing, E-Range EV's EcoPoint 3 technology creates a tire with lower rolling resistance and longer range, while offering low levels of wear and high grip. All this while staying affordable. Go to erangetires.com. That's E-R-A-N-G-E, tires.com, to find your EV's next set of tires. Hello, and welcome to the Inside EV's podcast for December the 9th, 2022. This is episode number 140. Thanks for joining us. On today's show, we'll be talking about the winners of the Inside EV's slash motor1.com star awards. VW's MEB Plus platform, boosting range and charging speed, and GM goes with flow for an AC charging program. I'm Dominic Yoni, Inside AV's forum moderator and Inside AV's editor. Joining us today is the pertinacious Tom Logney, senior editor at Inside AV's and host of the YouTube channel State of Charge. We also have the mega meta, Mr. Martin Lee from the EV News Daily podcast, which is available on all the best podcast platforms. And we are also joined by Brandon Turkis, Managing Editor at MotorOne.com. And of course, Kyle Connor will join us in a bit uh, from the majestic, practically palatial halls of Autospec Studios, where he produces high-voltage videos for a growing number of YouTube channels. All right. So welcome, everybody. Hey, guys. Hey, Pertin- how's it going, guys? Thanks for having uh, me on. Pertinacious. Pertinacious. Hold it tenaciously <laughs> to a purpose, course of action, or opinion. Damn working with writers and me having to use dictionary.com to work yeah. out what they mean. I, I'm <laughs> a writer and I've never doc. heard that word before, so I don't feel bad. <laughs> well, Dom is such a wordsmith. In all honesty, I hadn't either. <laughs> I just, <laughs> I just, no. that's, that's a risky like, game well, using words you've not, you don't know the meaning yeah, of. Well, I, 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 I saw it was, you know, I could see the pertinent <clears throat> part of the, the root of the word. And I said, oh, I never realized that was, oh, that's good. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, if so, someone can get pertinacious into the comment section, they'll get a gold star. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so let's kick this thing off with some news and then get to what we've been driving this week. But uh, let's start with the Inside EVs Motor One Star Awards. Actually, the more the Motor One Star Awards, but we're involved in there somewhat. Uh, so these are our own awards, and this is the second year that they've been handed out. Uh, so this has mostly been handled by Motor One staff so far, and there's a mix of electric and combustion vehicles competing. So we'll take a look at what they've chosen. There's seven categories. Um, to, 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 Best EV, best performance, best luxury, best SUV, best truck, and finally, editor's choice. Okay, so electric vehicles did not win every category like we think they ought to have, but they did win some big ones. Um, and we'll focus on those, but let's start with some background and some ground rules. Uh, real quick, Brandon, can you tell us how the initial set of vehicles were chosen? For instance, uh, someone in our audience will want to know why there wasn't anything from Tesla. Yeah, and it, it's a totally a valid question. Um, you know, when when designing something like this, you you have to set limitations. Um, we only have so much manpower. We only have so much ability to to manage cars. And you know, when we've got twenty cars maximum that we can kind of handle, um, we can't necessarily invite everything that we would like to. We made the decision to focus only on vehicles that are all new or redesigned within the past year. Um, the cutoff date for this year was September 1st, um, and it stretched all the way back to the end of August in 2021. So it was limited only to vehicles that we drove and rated during those 365 days. And that was that was done really just to focus on the newest vehicles and to, to be entirely honest, to make things a little bit easier for us. So we were constantly wrestling with, well, does this vehicle deserve it? Even though it's, you know, at the end of its life cycle, or there hasn't really been any news with this, even though we really like it and it scored really well. So it was, it was definitely done to, you know, to, to kind of hem in the vehicles that were allowed to compete and, and focus exclusively on, on the newest vehicles. Right on. All right. Uh, I don't anyone have any questions? We're all good with that. Okay. So let's start with the best truck of 2022. So I've, I've just picking 
pick the, the the categories that we've had EV wins in, and we can talk about some of the other categories where they didn't win. If sure, uh, if you if you'd like. Yeah, I mean, it EVs competed in. I want to say every category except for best value, which was the only category that had a price cap. It was forty thousand dollars. Um, so I but we had EVs competing in in every single category. There's some good values actually in electric vehicles at the forty thousand mark, but then those prices got boosted uh, uh, over the course of you know from, from when they were released to to now, and I guess they they wouldn't make that cap. But. Yeah, and and you know we can we can talk about best value if if you want because it, it's it's really an interesting category. Um, you know, well, quickly, we, but one, what, what one best value? Uh, best value is the Ford Maverick Hybrid. Uh, see, that's a that's which an is, excellent choice. It's 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 a fantastic little truck, but right. you know value is we set a forty thousand dollar price cap, but there is more that goes into it than that. Um, you know the the Maverick right. won out and it was the cheapest, but we very nearly gave the award to the Acura Integra, which was one of the most uh-huh. expensive cars in that in in the contest. It was like thirty eight thousand um, dollars. <laughs> Pertinacious. He look at look, look at that. <laughs> All right. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, and well, in electric vehicles, is I mean, because the batteries are still so expensive, up upfront price is uh, usually a lot, uh, somewhat large, higher than traditional combustion cars. So, like, and when we talk about values in electric vehicles, we're thinking, oh, like the Chevy Bolt, but that's not like a new vehicle or, or refreshing right. last year, so you know, I have made it. But like a great example, like we, you know, we we gave our editor's choice award to the Hyundai Ionic Five, and a big reason is because oh, we all found it to be a, a fantastic value um, in terms of charge speed and range, performance, style, and, and and you know price. Even even fully loaded like the one that we had, um, I would have loved to have had a standard range single motor Ionic Five to compete for the best value award. Sure. Um, but I, you know, I'm not sure how how competitive it would have been really. Cause you've got to think about more than just ultimate price. You've got to think about how it makes you feel, how it drives all of these, right. these factors right. that play into it. Um, so value is kind of, it's, it, you can be very reductive with it, but there's really a lot that does go into, to a vehicle's value beyond just right. the price tag. Yeah. Right. And the interesting thing, Brandon is that, you know, what Dom was alluding to before, one of the hard things for electric vehicles for us for advocates, for people to explain about electric vehicles is you can't look at the MSRP, which is what you pretty much focus on with the best value is how much it costs. We have to introduce cost of ownership, total cost of ownership, when we talk about value for electric vehicles because they're going to cost more upfront. It's it's it's, sure. it's inevitable. For a while. But if you if you really break out like a five year ownership it, it it can cost four or five thousand dollars more than a comparable ice, but then at the end of that five years, it's cost the owner less when you do fueling and service and everything. So it's it's inherently and EVs and have an inherent disadvantage with with uh, the the ice vehicles in your um the, your value your best value category until the point when we look at five year total cost of ownership and compare all the cars that way. Yeah, no, I I totally agree with that. And it's, you know, I've said this, I've said this a lot about, um, about our process and about our rating system. Like there, there is no perfect rating system. It's, you know, we're very much limited by the, the resources, resources that we have. Um, I think there's, there's definitely a value pun intended to, to considering, you know, things like cost of ownership. It's, it's a difficult thing to, to manage, um, especially for an award like this, I, I think it, it, it does come into play, maybe not as much as it should. And I would love to see a way to get more EVs in there, but, um, you know, the, the $40,000 EV, once you get past the, the bolt and the leaf, like they're not terrifically common. So yeah. until Equinox um, next year, next year's going to yeah. be, next, next year's, year's going to be awesome. Next year, yeah. It's, this is, this is, you know, we're, we're constantly evolving the process and yeah. every year that we do this is, is a serious learning experience. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think next year, like Equinox, will be a a definite contender. I'm actually, I'm really excited to drive Equinox EV and Blazer yeah. EV for that matter. Right. Um, so yeah, I, it's it's going to be a thing that changes. I think you're slowly, you know, when we did this last year, last year was the first time that we did it. We had two EVs total. We had a Taycan and a Mustang Mach E. 
and you look at just how many more evs this year it was almost we had 20 cars and it was almost a quarter of the field right um and i think next year you know i'm just looking at like my my vehicle loan schedule i've had several instances this year where i'm driving evs for weeks on end nice. um so Good i, I think you. i kind of i mean yeah I'm, I'm in the middle of a string right now of let's see five evs in a row i want to say nice so so i mean we, we're gonna see evs slowly take over the awards contest i wouldn't be surprised if half the vehicles next year were were evs and that would definitely is gonna you know force us to take considerations on how we handle best the best value award right right so let's let's get to, into the pickup truck thing here so uh all right sorry i'm looking at my list here okay so best truck best truck of 2022 the contenders were uh ford maverick xlt hybrid gmc hummer ev edition one ford f-150 lightning and toyota tundra trd pro so i a little spoiler alert if you're watching us on on youtube or twitch or facebook you can see on our screen that we're looking at a picture of the 22 ford f-150 lightning and that little drum roll brandon i guess that's our winner yeah that was that's our winner this this category was really interesting because every vehicle in it was electrified in some way you know the maverick right. and the tundra were both hybrids the, the tundra hybrid is is a fantastic truck i mean it oh, is that it? is really a, a great powertrain um obviously we have hummer ev there um and the lightning and this one was this is a really hard category um simply because you, there are so many different things to consider because of the way that people use their trucks. Right. Um, ultimately the, the lightning one, because, and, and we talked about this a little bit last night um, during the, the, uh, during our yeah, podcast. Live stream, yeah. Yeah. During our, our live stream, you know, the lightning has the potential to, to change the market in a way that few vehicles do. Um, and it's doing that by just being a very good truck that happens to be an EV. It's not right. constantly reminding you about, you know, being an EV. Right. I can, I can answer that answer sure. that question. Again, that Daniel Kurtzman is asking us any reason why Rivian wasn't a nominee. Yeah. So uh, it kind of goes back to what I was saying about, about at the beginning about the, the eligibility, uh, the Rivian R1T simply came out. Um, it would have been, uh, would have qualified for last year's competition. Uh, it was a little bit too old for this year. They just just missed the cutoff, um, and we With weren't able to rate it, huh? But the R1S, yeah, and we we did invite the we did invite the R1S to attend, and Rivian was unable to provide a unit. Um, right. You know, they're 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 ramping up production, and right. their argument was we got to deliver cars to customers, which I I can absolutely respect, and I think is the right decision. So. No, no hard feelings there. I would have loved yeah. to have had Rivian there. I really, right. I, I, I really would have loved to have them there. Do we, oh, do man. we have that uh, conversation internally about? Well, if we can't get a car from the OEM or or the press fleet, you know, would we then go and churro one or or source one from a viewer or a listener? Where, where, what's the, what's the line? Right. Yeah, I mean. It, uh, to be entirely honest, it's not really a conversation that we have simply because there are, so, you know, we invited 20 vehicles, but I want to say when I was building it, our eligibility, I can actually pull it up, I think, um, somewhere. Our eligibility was, you know, pretty wild in terms of, let's see, award tracking. So we had, I mean, in the in the range of about, 80 or 90 cars that were ultimately eligible and like ranked by score and, and whatnot for, for all the different awards. And so we would, I don't think we would consider doing like a Turo or something like that simply because there are <clears throat> so many alternatives. Um, right. And that just adds a level of complexity that, you know, I'll be, I'll be entirely honest. I'm the one that's, you know, arranging loans of all these vehicles and, and managing the pickups and deliveries to, to some place in the middle of nowhere, California. And it just, that'd just be one more layer of complexity on top of it. Um, yeah. So I, I would love to have Rivian there though. That would have been, that would have been great. I, but I, I understand why they weren't. Right. So yeah, we've had this conversation with the uh, Hummer EV because the main two electric contenders in this are Hummer EV and Ford electric uh, Ford F-150 lightning. And we've, I've only driven, I haven't driven actually the lightning yet. Mm. Um, I have driven the Hummer, and that's 
you know, a blast. I think we, I don't know what you think of the Hummer, uh, Brandon, but I <laughs> have a hate. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to be diplomatic. I, I okay. respect that the Hummer, much like the F-150 will bring in non-traditional EV customers. Sure. Um, I honestly, I think it's, especially after I didn't, I wasn't really able to come to this conclusion on the first drive program, which Dom, we did that together. I think, um, yeah, in so, Arizona. Right? Yeah, that yeah, sounds yeah. right. Um, since then, I you know I I didn't love it as as a pickup truck. I think it's gonna be a great as when the SUV version comes out. Right. Um, it's a little bit too cramped inside as a truck. The bed is a little bit too small and too shallow. Right, and it's also just just massive. <laughs> right. Yeah, the bed's it's not the most utilitarian vehicle mm-hmm. out there. I think the actually the the, uh, the Chevy pickup truck coming the uh, the Evo EV. Silverado EV. It's going to have a lot of a lot of yeah. this stuff in there under in the powertrain at least, but in a much more uh, I think user friendly utilitarian package. Yeah, I was going to say I think I think Silverado EV is one of the vehicles I'm most looking forward to driving next year. I'm, yeah. I'm very very mm-hmm. eager to drive it. I think it looks fantastic. Right. Yeah, the Hummer is not for people that want a pickup truck. Let's face no. it. Right, you know, right, they, right. They, it's they it's a personality want, statement. They want an outrageous vehicle to yeah. make people look at them when they drive down the road, and and it works. It, it does that well. <laughs> everywhere you go, people stop and look at you. Yeah. Everywhere. I mean, Let I've me driven you, I, a few times, and it's nuts. It's, it's I, I picked I picked this thing up in Southern California at, at LAX and drove it for an hour and a half, like north of Santa Clarita, to where we were testing. And okay. you drive down the the freeways in LA, and it just it's such an attention grabber. Yeah, I mean, it's even the even of LA, it's yeah. I mean, many lanes for it to take up. <laughs> <laughs> I I personally love driving this thing. I, I had such a blast. I really love the just the way it's so ridiculous. And, but it is, it is huge. And I'll tell you what I didn't like, Dom, was pulling into an Electrify America site oh. and trying to fit in a slot to plug in and mm, charge. Yes. Especially when it's when the, the they're pulling slots with the, the the units on the side and there's another car there. It doesn't right. fit. Like you can't open your door. It's so wide. It's crazy. Right. Yeah, this is this is for people who have garages who can charge at home, basically. I mean, it wouldn't mm. fit in my garage. Like it, it barely right. fit in my driveway when I had it. And I, you know, fortunately, I have my charger is outside, and I can I can make it work. But you know, when I had one of these on on loan, like it was it was a challenge the entire time. You know, fitting it into just normal places. Yeah, right. It fit in here, but it was tight. I the the mirrors had to go in on the side, and I had like two inches on both sides. I had to be nearly perfect backing it in, but I did get it in the garage here. <clears throat> but a, another thing about it is, you know, the that GM didn't have their eighty kilowatt on uh, eighty amp onboard charger ready for mm. production of Hummer, so right. it has a forty eight amp onboard charger. It charges terribly slowly yeah. on level two charging I at see, home yeah. mm-hmm. and because and because it's so inefficient. You use a lot of kilowatt hours, so you got to pump a lot back in every day. And um, yeah. you know that's that's yeah. until until they get the eighty amp onboard charger. I think that's going to come standard next year. Um, it's 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 not a good home charging EV at all. Well, it, the 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 hum, the Hummer EV, like the the production story with it, is is really interesting because it feels like the there were there were corners cut like that eighty eighty amp charging module being like a key one quarters that were right. cut to hit this this production goal and you know gmc was very very clear that it needed to be in production by the end of 2021 and it, it i think they delivered one and hit that goal right, right but you know from 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 gestation to production like was only about two years for this thing yeah, which super is a short program yep. it's a super short program and yeah so i mean i think I think that they may have hamstrung themselves. I think the fact that it doesn't have the ADM charger, the fact that uh, dual motor models are still several years away, right? Um, more affordable models. This is a hundred and twelve thousand dollar vehicle right. that we had here. Yeah, um, and it, it's wild. But I, 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 I kind of wish that GM had been. A, this is weird for me to say, but no, a little bit more conservative. Okay, and and had you know. Focus on getting ADM charging out. Focus on getting dual motor models out. Right. Um, things that people can actually buy. There is and just fully so much baking price. the software. Mm. The soft, the DC fast charging software is not fully baked. I've yet to record a good, clean zero to one hundred session, and I've DC fast charged two different Hummers on seven different occasions. 
So it's uh, <clears throat> their software is not fully baked. Right. Um, all right. So, but let's move on. Uh, let's talk best EV. The contenders for best EV were the GMC Hummer EV, Ford F-150 Lightning, BMW iX xDrive 50, uh, Lucid Air Grand Touring, and Hyundai Ioniq 5. So, Tom, did, I believe, you, did you have a, a hand in choosing these at all? Yeah, so unfortunately, I couldn't attend the the um, the voting right. this year. The guys did invite me to be invite me to be the Inside EVs representative out, but I already had committed to going to um, Germany with uh, with Mercedes on the same week they were doing their testing. Right. But they did. Uh, I, I was very thankful that they called me up and asked me to weigh in on on the electric vehicles. Right. And uh, so, yeah, um, my, I, I did vote for the Lightning for the best EV. I could be biased because I own one, uh, but I have driven all of the other EVs on this. And I admitted it was a really tough decision because, the, I mean, the Lucid yeah. Air is a fantastic, groundbreaking electric vehicle. Right. I love the BMW iX. It's, it's, it's you know, uh, I got addicted to it after driving. And that was the biggest surprise when I drove the iX and the i4. When I went on the first drive, I fully intended, expected that I was going to love the i4. I was going to be like, this, I want I want one of these. And like, I was looking forward to driving the iX. When I came home, I was like, I want an iX. The i4 is cool, but I want an iX. And so that's how good it is. Um, driving wise, quiet, luxury. I, I mean, I don't love the nose, but we know we all, we've all been beating that down. That's a dead horse. Yeah. Um, the styling on the front. I, I really, you know, wish I'd gone in a different direction. But the vehicle is a fantastic vehicle. But and and Brandon and I talked about this. You know, one of the, the reasons I think what pushed the lightning over the edge to me was how important of an electric vehicle I think that was for the entire industry. And if Ford didn't get it right, if Ford flubbed on this one and the lightning was, a, you know, just, you know, a half baked uh, electric vehicle that just w wasn't good, then I think it would have just everyone would have said, look, pickup truck, electric pickup trucks just aren't going to work. And, you know, and it would have set adoption back a, a bit. But the fact that Ford, in my opinion, really na nailed it, I think they did an unbelievable job with, with the Lightning. That gave it bonus points for me and kind of pushed it ahead of, say, Lucid and, and, and the IX and the Ionic 5, which I love the Ionic 5 also. This was, this was a good crop of EVs. If any of them won, I, I think that you, you couldn't argue about it. So I did vote for the, the F-150 Lightning, and it, it did end up winning. Okay. So Martin or Brandon, would you have chosen anything different? I'll, I'll let Martin answer that. Cause I, I, you know, yeah, I was sure. there. <laughs> sure. You're deep into it. Martin, what do, what do you think? Looking at that list of cars. Yeah. And any of them could have been the winner. And for me, the ability for the lightning to change a market is probably where I imagine I would have given this the nod because of all the you know of all the incredible of all the incredible things about the the competitors the lucid you know to even get the lucid out the door is amazing uh, and and the Hyundai Arnic Five with its you know there there are Taycans and Audi e-trons with eight hundred volt architectures and then there's the kind of cars that the you know the rest of us can buy um, right, with right. with a similar architecture. So um, you know, just that platform is is fantastic. But yeah, I think for the Lightning, and that's you know interesting for me to say because we don't have truck culture over here. That's so right. again, it's me trying to put my you know put myself in your shoes. The the importance of this vehicle and to arrive being so good is probably where it, it would have tipped it. But yeah, no clear winner in this category at all. Right. Yeah, I mean the I've I've kind of felt this way about the the lightning for a long time. It is what the one that I voted for. Um, you know, it, I think I think vehicles like this, and I want to go into a little bit why I think it's it's so transformational. Um, Tom's absolutely right. If if Ford had flubbed this, it would have set electric trucks back uh, for years. But what really does it for me with vehicles like the F-150, like the E-Transit, and like the electric Sprinter, which I think, Tom, you've driven, or uh, am I imagining that? So I went on the, the media event for the Sprinter, but we're, we're not allowed to talk there, anything okay. about what we did. It's, very, it's still embargoed. Okay, no worries. very strict, yeah. 
no so i mean i think those vehicles they're the they are the most consequential vehicles coming to market because they're the vehicles that are going to be assigned to non-traditional ev customers they are not going to have to like mm. pay for them their businesses are going to buy them and say you have to drive this and they're going to drive an e-transit or an e-sprinter or a lightning pro day in and day out for work and they're going to experience that charging they're going to experience that performance and and livability of it all and mm. i think that's going to kind of kind of sell people that might not have normally considered an ev before um and that's that's really what you know the transformational effect that i think this vehicle is going to have it's, it's a big reason why i voted for it yeah. and I, I agree with the follow-up with what brandon said the you can't just focus on retail customers right um the 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 commercial side and ford is investing a lot of time and energy into ford pro right. into the whole ecosystem of electric drive for their future transits and lightnings um you know how they're making this whole very simple for businesses to install a depot with charging equipment with software that manages range and charging and and um, scheduling charging and making sure all the vehicles are charged as much as they need to to leave the next day. So, you know, that whole ecosystem is part of this. And Ford's really spent a lot of time and effort. As a matter of fact, next week I'm going out to Detroit to do even a, a further deep drive, drive, dive with, with Ford into Ford Pro and their electrification efforts. And I'm going to get another a uh, tour of the uh, Rouge Electric Vehicle uh, center, uh, the Manufacturing Plant, which I'm looking forward to. Sweet. But that's Ford is is very proud, and they should be, of what they've done for the commercial side. And that's really important because, as Brendan said, there's going to be people that would never consider an electric vehicle, and they're going to they're working for companies, and they're going to drive a, a Ford Lightning Pro or a, an E Transit for work. And you know, after a couple of months of driving it, they're going to be like, "Yeah, this 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 will work for the family," and 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 help you know, transition people into electric drive. So the, that the whole ecosystem of the lightning, it wasn't just for me, the driving experience, the, the features that Ford put in it, intelligent backup power, all that added to it. But right. for me, I had to consider the whole, the whole, you know, ecosystem that Ford is building around the lightning. That was part of the reason why I said, this is, this is the biggest thing that happened to us this year. And that maybe the best thing. I could, I could, I could mm. nerd out on the Ford Pro stuff because it, it is so cool and it is so, it's so, just obvious, you know that, like the the steps that Ford is taking, they just make sense and they're going to help, actively help businesses transition to EVs and that's going to help customers transition to EVs and it's just it's such an o great overarching effort in the Lightning. Um, yeah, I think you could you could realistically argue that. Um, this award we gave this award to Lightning, but what really did it was the over overall what Ford is doing um, in general with its electrification efforts with Lightning and E Transit. Yeah, right. and it's one a, last a, one oh, last sorry. comment on before we switch uh, the Inside EVs. The podcast followers here know I've been talking about this for the last year. I have both the Rivian R1T and the and the Lightning and. Before I got both of them, I said, look, I only need one truck in the household. I'm going to get them mm. both. I'm going to drive them for a while, and then I'll decide, and I'll, and I'll end up selling one of them. Um, and quite honestly, in the back of my mind, I was fully expecting I would sell the Lightning. Uh, I was fully mm. expecting I would prefer the Rivian because it's kind of like – cooler you know i mean you look at it it's very unique it's got the four motors it's got it's gear athletic. tunnel uh, you know it's it, at, at, at the time mm -hmm. it, yeah at the time it had the camp kitchen which they've deleted um which i really mm. wanted and i ordered with the truck and now i can't get that oh wait so they the, deleted it they deleted it yeah well they oh, haven't ooh. officially announced it brandon but they removed it from my order refunded my money and at Ooh. first they said, oh, we'll, we'll, we're, it's just going to be delayed. But they right. wouldn't have refunded my money if it was going to be no. delayed. They would have held on to that money and said, oh, you know, and sick, or at least asked me. So they refunded the money. And, and now it's like ambiguous of when, is, when will this come? And I, I think they're just axing it, mm. you know, until, you know, way, they're kicking the can way down the road because they're focusing on everything else. But I, I fully expected that. I was going to say, you know, I like the Lightning too, but this Rivian is just so cool that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go with that. I'm telling you guys, I'm, I'm months in now, and I can't choose which one. I'm going to drive them both through the winter. I'm actually putting KO2s on the Lightning tomorrow because the Rivian has already has the all-terrain tires. So I'm putting the KO2s on the Lightning. I'm going to drive the hell out of them this winter through the snow and everything. And in the spring, I'll decide. But if you put a gun to my head today, I think I'd keep the Lightning. 
And how, how how amazing is that over the over over the Rivian? It's just such a great truck. How do yeah, you how do you decide which one you're going to drive? Like, is it what mood you're in? Is it whether you want? I don't know. Like the different. I'll tell you how I decide. How do you Meredith gets up before me. <laughs> Whatever vehicle's left in the driveway, I drive. <laughs> there you go. That's the ultimate But, but here's choice. the thing, Martin. Long drives. Like we went up to Canada. It was a 1,200-mile round trip. We went up to Vermont. It was a 600-mile round trip. The Lightning gets taken on the long drives. It's much more comfortable, much more plush. It's a yeah. better long uh, road trip vehicle. Um, if I, if they're both in the, in the driveway and I'm just running to get a cup of coffee, I'm doing errands around town. I take the Rivian, but when it's a long drive, my butts in the lightning. Right. right. Wow. I got actually, I got the ride in the Rivian R1T last couple of weekends ago, Kyle's. And so it was my first time in, inside that vehicle and I can see what you're saying. It's, it's nice, but it's, it's not like plush. Like like the Ford F one fifty Lightning is at all you know like the softness you know this one you can hear the motors you, you can it's you know a, it's a different kind of truck yeah but yeah. but interestingly I think my my wife prefers driving the Rivian and right. not just because it's smaller she says it's more engaging and it is right. mm -hmm. like yeah, she yeah. Uh, the funny thing is she's like you know oh it handles better it's like you know I, I feel like I'm driving a, a sports car. And you have that's, a on good, the podcast that's a good way to describe it compared to the lightning and the lightning just kind of floats. It is dead. So how, how quiet Brandon is a lightning. It's like, it's, it, it, it's, I, it's I almost want to be quiet. I almost want to buy like the, the high end one, the platinum one, because it's the only one that comes with acceleration sound because it is so spookily quiet, even in, even in a pro, I mean, it is the, the ride quality, the, the refinement of it all. And I, I mentioned this in our video for, I want to say when we were talking about uh, it was for best truck or best e best EV, I think, you know, it really highlights the the work that Ford has done beyond just electrifying this truck. It is so much more refined than a gas powered F-150. I mean, it's really, really wild uh, how how good it is in terms of comfort. Um, I'm actually I'm getting a lightning in about a week from now. And it's the it's the first one I've first time since, you know, awards testing and the drive program earlier this year that i'm going to get to spend time with it and r really really excited to drive it for a week and and you know experience it especially in a michigan winter yeah and Lori, i sold the tesla to buy the uh the rivian so i uh, right now i don't have we have two vehicles here they're two electric pickup trucks that's it um right. and robert asked doesn't the rivian charge faster than the lightning um that that's a big no even though most people assume it does. And I'm going to have a long video, probably 45 minute video explaining mm -hmm. everything. There are certain use cases where the Rivian charges faster. If you charge for a very short period of time on a DC fast charger, um, you know, that can deliver the, the, the more than 200 kilowatts. The, the Rivian holds uh, an advantage for about 10 or 15 minutes, but over, if you charge to 80% and I have all the recordings, I've recorded both of them. 12 times both trucks from 10 percent to 80 15 percent to 80 20 percent to 80 i have all the full recordings i'm going to go side by side believe it or not the lightning gets to 80 percent faster than the rivian does even though the lightning uh -huh. doesn't have nearly as high a, uh, as a Peak. dc fast charge rate but if you unplug it 70 percent, the rivian beats the lightning um but here's the thing, talking about that, like we always talk about 10 to 80 or 20 to 80. It's the industry standard. I can't yeah. choose and pick what percentage I'm going to stop at. So one vehicle beats another. Um, right. But knowing that if you were to unplug at 70 percent, the Rivian does charge faster. But now you're leaving 30 percent of your range on the table if you're on a big, long road trip instead of just 20 percent of your range. And at home, my lightning charge is behind me here at at 18 kilowatts. I know it's 19.2 kilowatt DC fast charger. Oh, I mean, uh, really AC charger, but it only, it will only put 18 kilowatts into the battery. It accepts the ADM. So this, this pumps 18 kilowatts into my lightning and the Rivian stuck at 11 kilowatts. So um, they both have about the same efficiency. So the, the lightning and you do 90% of your charging at home, maybe more than 90%. So the, the lightning is cons con considerably a better charging electric vehicle than, than my Rivian is. Right on. All right. So uh, finally, and this was revealed last night on the special Star Awards live stream, Editor's Choice for 2022. You can find uh, that on the Motor1.com YouTube channel or on the Inside TV's uh, YouTube channel. 
Uh, and you can check that out if you want to get into the weeds and see what all the different, they had, how many people you had like six people on there last night, I think, right, Brandon? Yeah, it would have been me, Seth, Jeff Perez, Brett Evans, uh, then Chris Smith and Chris Bruce, who host the Rambling About Cars podcast. That's the uh, Motor One version of the Inside EVs podcast. Right. Um, so that's that's uh, that was a great little broadcast, and that's you can you can watch that again. It's still up on our channel. So, so this was the editor's choice for 2022. The contenders were the Acura Integra, uh, Hyundai, Hyundai, Hyundai. Hyundai. I'm so Hyundai. It's like Sunday, it's like it's like, like Sunday, a Sunday, Sunday, but with an H, right? It's a Sunday. running joke here it's on a, our podcast, yeah. Brandon. Okay. with, with, with right. Dominic. It's a whole thing. Um, yeah, uh, Audi RS3, Cadillac CT5V Blackwing, and Hyundai Hyundai <laughs> Elantra, and and the sporty sporty Elantra. Uh, so we know the F150 did not win this one. Brandon, do you want to do the honors? I think we, if you're watching this, we have a kind of a spoiler alert on the screen here. But <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, for our listeners, I think it's a, I think it's a testament to just how good the the Ionic Five is. That among a group of you know, we are we are I some of I would say we are we are car journalists, but really we're professional car enthusiasts. Um, it's a testament to how good the Ionic is that it beat out a. 670 horsepower like super sedan it beat out a a fantastic audi sports sedan i really love the rs3 um it beat out the elantra which is probably the the best performance value on the market right now um and it beat out the integra which is like i said when we were talking about best value is a really really great uh compact sedan for everyday driving um yeah, the Ionic is just it just ticked all the boxes for all of us. It's it's fun to drive. It it looks fantastic. It's probably my favorite design on the market right now. Uh, exterior design on the market right now. Uh, peak charge rate is great. Um, range is great. Uh, it's got some innovative features in it. It it's just it's such a total package. And you know the one we had was fully loaded, but you can get a really great Ionic five for forty seven forty eight grand MSRP. Um, and that's right. just. It's, it's just it's nuts. decent value. It's a decent value in the electric vehicle world. In that, in that, uh, what do you call it? large hi- high hatchback? Low it's a hatchback. Basketball. I, I, with respect to my friends at Motor Trend, it's not a crossover. Right, right. Um, yeah, I think we go back and forth. I'm not sure. In my, in my, I, I tend tend to call it a crossover, but you know, I, I think I've actually, in my, I'd like to say, uh, like a low roof crossover because it's, but I mean, it's like a hatchback, but. In my mind, a hatchback is like an old Honda Civic, you know, or, or like the Spark EV that I had, or something like that. But this, yeah, obviously larger. So the people that chose this were mostly people who are, you know, very much into combustion cars and love the sound of, uh, you know, revving engines. And you know, not that there's anything wrong with that. Uh, so, but so it's it's pretty cool that they chose an like an electric vehicle for for their overall yeah, I mean- choice. It's 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 just such a it's such a fantastic overall package. Um, and you know one of the you know one of the things we really considered um, with editor's choice was which vehicle of the twenty that we had. You know we we only talked about the top five, um, but we can this this award was open to all twenty vehicles. It could have been the Hummer EV, it could have been the Lightning, it could have been the IX, it could have been uh, the Toyota Tundra or the Genesis G ninety. It could have been any of those vehicles. Um, but it was which vehicle are you would you be willing to spend your own money on to buy and maintain and live with and which one suits your lifestyle the best and right. you know you could make arguments that any of the vehicles would have done that really well but the fact that we kind of came to a consensus on the ionic 5 is you know indicative of just how complete of a vehicle it is i mean i right. i my wife and i are actually considering buying one like for her next car it's you know it, it suits our needs perfectly as you know two childless 30 somethings Right. Um, and I think it suits the needs of small families quite well and, and individuals. I mean, it's just, it really is a vehicle that, that will do everything for everyone. Right. And it handles well, it drives, it drives really well on the road besides, and it has a, this, this styling, you know, it's kind of like out there. It's kind of a gamble. So it's kind of nice to see. Um, yeah. So I don't know any, anything else we want to add Tom or Martin? 
No, I mean, right, Move right on. choice on the so editors, maybe... on the editors' choice. You know, correct choice on yeah. this because it is what they've done, and and they're already working on Im improvements. The Ionic Six we know is more efficient, not just because of the styling, but they said that they've made um, gains under the skin, and so right. they haven't just. It's not just a, a copy paste into the Ionic Six. It's not significant improvements, but it is a little bit better, and that tells me that they're working on making these cars better and actually there is a i don't know what it's called but there is a follow-up to the uh to the platform um uh, and and that, it, it all just gives me so much confidence in what hyundai and kia and, and genesis are doing um that i think yeah this is the right choice here definitely yeah I, I i mentioned this last night and i forgot to mention it here but like part of the part of my my reasoning for voting for the ionic five is that <clears throat> You know, it's it's available in so many flavors. You've got you've got the Hyundai Ionic Five, and you've got three different trims and two different battery sizes. Then you go to Kia, and you get a very different visual, <clears throat> very different visual statement. And then you go to Genesis, and it's different still, and it's more yeah. luxurious. And so, like, there are so many flavors of this vehicle that it it really covers such a huge range of the market. Um, oh, Kyle's here. Hey, Kyle. Hi, Kyle. Good morning. Good morning. Um, yeah, did you, did you want, hey, so I don't know if you caught any of that last segment, Kyle, but did you want to chime in on the editor's choice? Yeah. Oh, Ionic 5 rocks. No question. One of the best cars on the market. You know, whenever we see one, it's all about insane charging speeds, really put together package. I would have voted for CT5 V Blackwing because big skids and V8s, but, uh, Brandon, I think you made the sensible choice. Yeah. I mean, the, the combustion powered cars were great. Um, CT5 V Blackwing came really, really, really close. I mean, it right. was very, very close. Um, but yeah, it, it's the Ionic that did it for for me. I I, I didn't love the the, the CT5 V all that much, but yeah. So I, I would have chosen the F150 Lightning for this, but then I would have won every category, and I don't know <laughs> if that's even right. But but for me, well, like I can F150 the pickup truck to go, you know, fishing, throw a kayak in the back, <laughs> and all that kind of stuff. That's yeah, and Ionic, I like the Ionic Five a lot. If I didn't have want to do those other things, I would definitely go Ionic Five. Yeah, and that's where the the lifestyle argument comes into play. It, you know, does does this vehicle suit our lifestyle? And you know, that might introduce some some biases. But this is editor's choice. We're we're allowed right. to, you know, set our our objectivity aside and think about what's best, what works best for us. And you know, I'm I'm not much of a truck person. Um, you know, in, in yeah, so I, I respect the hell out of the F-150 for what it is. It just doesn't quite suit me personally. Right. Yeah, This was discussed last night during the live stream when the question was presented, well, if, you, if the F-150 Lightning was the best electric vehicle, how could you then say that the Ionic 5 gets the uh, Editor's Choice Award? And they explained, well, the, you know, um, the, the reason being is this is our choice. What would we like to drive? You know, and, and I don't think any of the people voting drive a pickup truck as their everyday vehicle. So they're, they're not inclined to be pickup truck owners. And the the crossover form, the Ionic 5 form, suits their family better. So this is what I want in my driveway. That was the explanation. Yeah. Um, and, you know, that that could that could very well change. Like, you know, it, if, if, if Rivian had been here, I might have been saying, like, actually, I want the Rivian. Um, you know, the different different trucks for different people the maverick hybrid got, got a few votes for editor's choice too i mean That's so true. it's not it's not necessarily bias against uh against pickup trucks it's just you know our, our all of our lifestyles right now don't really demand that kind of a vehicle um but like i said we we you know we gave it two awards we clearly respect what the what the lightning brings to the table yeah all right, so let's uh, move on to some news uh so we're gonna have to say goodbye to brendan thank you yes. for hanging out with us for a while Thank you guys for having me on. It was great. Um, and yeah, we'll have much more Star Wars stuff in a little while. Right. <laughs> yeah, Brendan has to get started working on next year as soon as the podcast I over. really, really, really do. <laughs> Actually, no, I need to go write my review of the uh, Mercedes AMG C63. So Ooh, that's okay. what's on today's docket. Cool. Nice. So, all right. Thanks, guys. Take, Take care. care. Yeah. Ciao. All righty. So, it's... oh. Hey guys. All right. <laughs> so, all right. So this week we learned that the Volkswagen MEB plus platform is coming and that the automaker says it will offer 435 miles and charging speeds as fast as 200 kilowatts. 
So on its face, this seems like good news, but there's a lot going on in the background to this decision. So uh, leadership at Volkswagen changed recently with uh, Oliver Bloom taking over from Herbert Dice. Uh, now the strategy for rolling out Vs over the next decade has also changed. So previously, it was going to introduce flagship EV in 2026 to kick off the introduction of a new platform called Scalable Systems Platform, or the SSP. Uh, the program had the name Project Trinity. This, this platform was going to replace both the MEB platform and the PPE platform, which is supposed to go under the Porsche Macan, uh, along with some other vehicles still upcoming. So that all appears to be delayed, if not canceled, we don't know, uh, along with a factory that was going to be built to manufacture all this stuff. So instead, Volkswagen seems to be taking a more conservative approach and will evolve its MEB platform, call it MEB Plus, and it gets uh, the new generation of batteries that were going to go into the SSP platform, uh, what they're calling the Prismatic Unified Cell. And actually, the, the factory for those uh, cells uh, went into, they're building that already. They've, already, they've been, built, been building that since summer. Um, so we should see at least 10 new vehicles from VW on the MEB Plus platform by 2026, including an entry-level model in the 25,000 euro neighborhood. Kyle, do you think the MEB Plus has enough to be competitive? The range looks fine, but and uh, while the charging should be better, its its competitors are already at these kinds of charging speeds, right? It's sort of a shame, in my opinion, because again, we don't know 435 miles of what range on which car right. that's just a wltp yeah on the which best. model i mean it's it's we that's probably the best one right. uh, so but but overall range doesn't really matter so much it's all about the charging and unfortunately 200 kilowatt charging isn't class leading they're already okay. there with chattanooga id4 peaking over 190 kilowatts on that oh. car so there's no improvement here as far as i can tell sure they can get a little bit more range maybe some better efficiency they really need to work on software, really need to work on software. But I think this is almost as predicted going into the future where, okay, well, we've sort of, you know, reached, or I should say covered all of the barriers of electric entry. Infrastructure is maybe getting a little bit better or worse. You can argue either way. But it's like this fits within the normal person's use case. You're going to be able to charge it at home. It's got all the specs you need to take it on a road trip. And so it's fine, but people who want the class leading, bleeding edge stuff are not going to go for this at all. Probably fine if the price is then reflecting the fact that this is mainstream technology that people who, you know, super into EVs aren't going to get excited about, but it, they just want a car to do jobs for them. Uh, and if the price can, like the, you know, the, the Chattanooga ID4 price. If it can start to reflect the savings they're making, then they're onto a winner. If they don't, then that's an issue. Because I was, what I liked about Herbert Dees and his management, not being someone who works for VW myself, was he seemed quite happy to uh, take a risk on what they had today for greater returns tomorrow. Whereas what they seem to be doing now, which is a bit more German iterative making things five percent better here five percent better there is a is more of a case of okay let's not blow everything up but let's just have the meb platform call it meb plus they're still going to use the unified cell the right. ssp platform obviously they've done the orders with the chinese suppliers moving away from the south koreans so they you know they're taking bits of the old plan but i'm like kyle i'm disappointed that the old plan never got a a chance to see it through because that was a proper, right, let's build a whole new factory. Let's change the way we build cars. Tesla are kicking our butts in terms of how long it takes to make a vehicle. And yeah. so let's let's catch up and be as good as them. And this is this keeps things like works councils happy. This keeps unions happy. This is, you know, they're not shutting anything down. They're going to retrain people. It's a slightly better system than, than what we've got right now. Question is, is that enough? It, it might be. It might be. So especially if they're going to start making cars in China, lower costs, if that can be passed on, it's probably okay. It's a shame. It's probably okay. Right. They are going to be making some cars in China. I think the Cooper Tavascan EV is going yeah. to be a, a China built one imported to Europe. Not, we're not sure if that's, we don't have Cooper here in the U S but no, you won't get that, but it's the, uh, it's their third JV. It's called uh, Volkswagen and Nui. 
I think that's how I say it. Um, the one with JAC, uh, they took a, a bigger share of that recently. They now own 75% okay. of that JV. And their first pre-production car rolled off that factory yesterday. Uh, they started building it in July 21. So a year and a half to make the factory. Um, so six months behind Tesla Shanghai and the first car rolled off yesterday, but they won't say what's coming out of their first. It would seem the Tavascan would seem early. That's that's Cupra's version of the ID5 slash ENIAC. So okay, uh, maybe it's a little early for that. It could be. So yeah, look, if you I don't care where a car is made as long as it's a decent car and people yeah. are treated right who make it. So right, yeah, it's important. Um, yeah, so I'm not sure exactly where. Uh, Volkswagen is going to land with this because it's, it's like you're saying about price. It this, it's going to have some stiff pricing competition from Chevrolet, I think, with the Equinox and Blazers. Uh, man, yeah, I mean, it, it's so they own Europe and they have a lot of they're in a lot of markets, so they can make it work for them. But yeah, it's, it's not the it feels like a step backwards in some ways to me too. But yeah, but they, you know sometimes you have to go a little bit backwards. To, have a more confident forward motion when you are making that forward motion because they, they you know they don't want to fail you like because they, they did take a risk and it didn't pay off for them in some respects because their software didn't keep up with the rest of the program you know and it kind of just held everything back and there's a lot of disappointment there and I, I think that's kind of what's basically behind this whole thing is like the failure you know in this in the software and the things to, to really come through just to bring up another Volkswagen point, I don't know if you were planning on doing it, but Volkswagen mentioned that the next ID three, sort of the refresh, oh, right, uh -huh. is sort of ready to rock and roll. Don't know if we were going to talk about that. There we go. I, I had that in my uh, my notes at some point, and then nice. I put it off my screen, and I don't have it in my actual show notes. <laughs> but I'm so I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing ID three facelift. That's only been a, a couple of years, right? Three years that's been out. Three years now. Three years. Okay. Bring back the buttons on the steering wheel, which they're doing. Okay. Yeah. What else do we want from that? Better software. Yes. More or luxury. It to come yeah. to America. Everyone yeah, to come oh, to America. of course. But yeah, looking like, but looking like the Cuba, uh, the Cooper Born. No, that's, <clears> no I actually I'm, don't think I like the way the Cooper Born looks in comparison oh, yeah? to the ID three. Okay. You get a good spec ID3 on the big wheels and it's just classic. But then you see a Cooper Born, it's got all these angles all over it. And they the problem is most people spec the Cooper Born with the little arrow wheels. So you just see this oh. aggressive looking thing on these ugly wheels driving down the road. Oh, that's no good. You're yeah. right. All right. Uh, yeah. so. But I don't think I don't think improving it to 170 to 200 kilowatts is good enough. I think that's because they're not talking about what's happening now. That's 2024 onwards, yeah. and that's their road plan to get through to 2028 when the 800 volt architecture arrives. And like that's that's light years away in EV world. Yeah. Well, the that's car will do. Uh, so it requests 500 amps when you're low. So you'll max out a charger at your pack voltage, uh, if as long as you get the big battery one, which will right. do 194, 195 kilowatt for wow. a short period. Sits at 180 for a large portion. But I tested ID Buzz charging. I'm going to post that video at some point, I think next week. And ID Buzz charging, big peak. The middle is a little weak, but then it it just rockets up top. It's like an e-tron. It's like 49 minutes, zero to 100%. So that car has no range, good. but charges great, in my opinion, for deep charging. Someone sent me a note about how it charges quicker than a Model 3. And I've not, apparently it was a, a Björn Newland video um, in Norway. I've not watched it yet, but one of my listeners said, Hey, like, just get, show the buzz more love. It it it's a charging monster. I'm like, okay, yeah, um, no peak speeds, but like, if you look at the overall curve, that sucker just takes the juice all the way through. Look at what Volvo, like Volvo, just updated their Euro spec uh, XC40 and C40. Moved the right. motor from the front axle to the rear, so rear wheel drive now. Bigger motor, finally, kilo, four Ooh. kilowatt hours more in the battery, but increase the peak charging from 150 to 200. Like that's that's a step. And that's yeah. now. That's today. Well, it's for the 2023 model year. It arrives in spring. Um, but that's a decent improvement because the X, nothing wrong with the XC40 and the C40. Great cars. But they've just turned it all up a little bit here and there. And it's all. And again, you don't. You guys don't get the single motor, do you? Um, you we the, do on Polestar, oh. but not XC40. Right. You would think the same for Polestar as well. It's all I'm pretty tech. sure it is. So, uh, so yeah, just I mean, that's a decent improvement. I don't think VW have been ambitious enough here with that. These improvements. Right on. 
All right. Uh, so speaking of VW, US owners are also getting an update. Finally, that's uh, not an OTA, though. Uh, the update will enhance the charging experience. En enhance, I don't know what that means. Uh, and further improve system performance, they say. The most notable upgrades include auto hold. That's a, a, a I, then there's also a charge routing feature added in the native navigation system and more information for drivers in the ID cockpit digital display. The, the automaker also claims that uh, the upgrade will bring minor bug fixes and some security improvements. So I'm not really sure what, what's all, with all that. I don't know, Kyle, you have a, a family member that has an ID4, but it's uh, Chattanooga. They might not need this. This is for 2021 models and some 2022 models. Maybe yeah, not. we produced a whole in-depth podcast on this one, on this situation, because ID4 is really needed software updates. And honestly, this is a year and a half, two years too late. Uh, just insane, honestly, how slow things are moving over there. Yeah, I am typically a Volkswagen guy because I like how the cars are made. I love the way they drive. I think they're built really well. I love the ID4. My friend Colton's getting one. Michaela ha has hers. Really, I think it's a great buy. All of the Chattanooga cars, all the new stuff have software 3.1. So this is purely for older ID4 to sort of match where the new cars are. Why it took them so long to do it, I don't know. You also, part of this upgrade for 2021 cars is you have to change out the 12 volt battery. And they're going to be putting in a lithium ion battery instead of whatever they have in there now, just a regular car battery. Interesting. And so that's why you have to go to the dealer. But you also have to go to the dealer because they can't support over the air updates because they didn't future proof the car. And it's like, hello, this car launched in 2021. Model S has been doing updates since 2012. Right. What is going on with Volkswagen software? We keep saying it. And, and what's even crazier is there's no plug in charge on this car. No plug in charge. Volkswagen and Electrify America are in bed together, whether they want to say it or not. It's part of Volkswagen Group. And right. uh, these cars plug and charge on Ionity, so they have the capability. Why Why do these cars not plug and charge on Electrify America? And it just tells me that no one cares. Yeah. It's amazing uh, well, that they don't. And it's, I, I, I it's, guess. they're not Go just ahead, in sorry. bed together. Volkswagen owns Electrify America. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's not just all oh, their partners. They own electrify america you know so it's it's shocking to me that 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 they still don't have plug in charge right uh, i i don't i want to say that i don't think they don't care but there's there's obviously no, they something do not care do <laughs> not care there's no way around it okay man yeah they don't care if they wanted to, it's a two second thing. You just spend a week at their lab, you get plug and charge working, you throw it in the little car. It's it is trivial stuff. Okay. Um so uh, uh, let's move along. I'm gonna move along. We beat up <laughs> Dom got shut we, down pretty quickly there. We beat up on, <laughs> beat up on like VW for so long. Making like excuses it. for Volkswagen on this podcast. No, I like I yeah. like Dom. I like this new strict Dom. He's like, right, you're done. Move on. This, <laughs> this is good. I'm here for this. All right. Um, so, but yeah, we, we got to get on to the next subject. So this week, uh, General Motors launched its dealer community charging program. So this program should place about 40,000 19.2 kilowatt AC chargers in community spaces chosen by local dealerships. Uh, their network partner in this is the company Flow. They'll supply the chargers and also monitor monitor and maintain them. About 1,000 dealerships have signed onto the program so far. It's open to the Chevrolet dealerships right now, and it's going to open up to Cadillac and Buick and GMCs uh, in the new year. Mm. Um, so, right. So, right, 1,000 so far, and the first units are already in the ground, as you can see on this. If you're watching us on uh, YouTube or Twitch, we have a picture up there showing the Ultium Charge 360 installation with the name of the dealer dealership on the bottom part of the so there's good signage on these i think or there's hopefully there's more signage in the parking lot. i don't know i'm, I'm yeah well, that's a whole other mm. podcast to talk about signs but um so i so i wrote the story up but i'm also kind of conflicted about it more chargers are great but these seem to be more about community relations than than really helping drivers who can't charge at home i think i'd, I'd rather see or I'd rather have seen DC fast chargers or more of them, uh, much fewer units, but a lot more throughput. Like say, if you live in a small town and you have no way to charge, 
Are you going to want to spend five or six hours uh, once or twice a week charging your car at a library or a park? Or would you rather do the same thing in, in 30 minutes? Well, you know, one, one evening, you know, half an hour, hit the supercharger on your way. You know, I don't know. Uh, what do you think, Tom? I think there's a place in the market for all types of different uh, public charging, Dom. I, sure. I think we can't just answer every new charging program with, oh, they should have put in 10, 350 kilowatt DC sure. fast chargers. Um, you know, so would I prefer? Of course, but we're not going to have, every location isn't going to have DC fast charging. I had this conversation with somebody, even with the Ford's new plan with their dealerships, where they have to put in a DC fast charger and people are arguing that who wants to go to a dealership. And my, my answer is this isn't replacing what Electrify America and EVgo and, and ChargePoint, whatever, they're all right. doing their own thing. These are supplemental. These are, yeah. we want plugs everywhere. Some of the plugs are going to be high speed DC fast chargers. Some are going to be a little bit lower speed DC fast chargers. Some are going to be seven kilowatt AC. This is great that it's that it's uh, you know 80, 80 amp AC. Yeah, that's so, amazing that part. You know, yeah. yeah, I'm not gonna every time a new charging program comes out, I'm not gonna say, oh, I wish it was DC fast chargers. You know, I mean, we should all say, yeah, I, I wish everywhere was. I wish we all had DC fast chargers in our garages. You know, so we could <laughs> thirty minutes have 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 a, a full battery. But that that's not how this is going to play out. So let's not, you know, let's not um, uh, criticize the the good, you know, because uh, it's not perfect. Uh, I, right. I think this works. And what I like about it is that G GM is going to be they almost are like tipping their hand here because if if they're investing in all these eighty amp, you know, nineteen kilowatt AC chargers, they're basically telling us that's what they're going to put in their cars moving forward yeah, because well, they all, wouldn't all be the investing in all this. I think all the future. GM vehicles, except maybe the the least expensive, really small battery ones, are going to have 80 amp onboard charging. That's what I would do if I was their plan. If I'm if I'm investing all these, and you know, the, if if you're pumping in about 18 kilowatts, uh, you know, you're going to get 18 kilowatts in, in an a kilowatt hour in an hour of charging. Uh, you know, if you're in a shopping center or something, that's going to be good for like you know, 50 to 80 miles of driving. And oh, yeah, that's you driving know driving for a whole day, yeah. Yeah, I mean that's that's DC. pretty good. Every stop doesn't have to be a DC fast charger. That's my take on it. Who's paying for these? Uh, this comes out of the uh, uh, GM's money that they set aside for the program. They set aside. I don't want to. I, I wrote the uh, I wrote the figure wrong. I dropped off a zero when I wrote it. Oh, seven hundred and fifty million dollars they set aside for our infrastructure. So this comes out of that earmark. So that's is that funds. It, that is that the federal in money that has been unlocked by the infrastructure no. the ira i think this oh, is okay. separate from that i don't think this is taking advantage of that i'm not sure if it's so this is gm's it's money so right. why is there not a big gm they logo have applied them? well i mean it's got the dealership logo i think they've opted to use and it has the ultimate charge 360 branding which i think is basically ah. gm's well, okay. thing and then the individual uh dealerships will have you know their branding you know they have chevrolet gmc at this particular one wheelers so are the, are the are the dealers paying? Like the Ford dealers have got to pay? Uh, I don't think that. I think that actually they didn't break it down. I didn't sound like the dealers had to pay much, but they did have to do a lot of work as far as you know. Uh, GM's giving them uh, sort of uh, guiding them along the process, like where to put them. You know, all the permitting, all the you know, there's a lot of technical stuff that goes into okay. placing chargers. So GM's kind of holding their hands. With that, but I'm not sure. I don't think a lot of the funding for them is coming from is coming from the dealers in this case. I tell you what, the the, the worst thing would be in five years' time is to have forty thousand broken charges. The most important thing is, right. and you know what, D don't put as many in, but make sure you got some money to maintain them and have half decent engineers going out to these things and and cleaning them and stuff. And by the way, companies do that. I think I've mentioned before on the podcast. I turned up at a charger the other uh, a little while ago. And there's a guy trimming the hedges around them because it was getting a bit overgrown. Ah, right. um, and this is a network called Instavolt we have here. And I'm like, I plugged in. He's an electrical engineer uh, by trade. I'm like, is this part of your job? He said, well, it's not in the job description, but it looks it was starting to be overgrown and it looked it looked bad. So I yeah. went down the the the, the DIY store and uh, and got some equipment and I'm cutting the cutting the hedges back. And I and I thought. A lot of companies wouldn't do that. A lot of electrical engineers be like, "Nope, that's safe. I've signed it off. Right, where, where have I got to drive to next?" And he was taking real pride in his work. And that's that's one of the best examples I've come up with. And then we've all gone to plug in 
more recently, I, I reckon it's getting worse as well. And just charges aren't working. And as long as these are maintained, because, you know, DC fast chargers can make you some good money. There's a reason to it. To, and half of those don't work as well. But um, but these aren't going to be big money spinners. But what is smart? So make sure they're maintained. What is smart is the dealers are going to advise where to put them. Yeah. Yeah. It's more community oriented. See, it's good, I think, for, for you know, because dealerships traditionally have a, like a take up a community role. They sponsor baseball teams. You know, they're out there. You know, they, they want to be, you know, very uh, visible in their communities. And this is just part of that. Yeah. Um, but they, they know that they know their communities. They'll know yeah. where someone goes to spend two hours, uh, rather than somebody sitting in a central location, at, you know, uh, in Detroit being like, okay, where should we put charges? So right. that's really smart. Let, let local businesses be part of the community. So that that's cool. And I, I like that they're not making them put the charges like at the dealerships because people, you know, like you say, they don't really go to dealerships to charge their cars. It's the dealership can choose better locations. Oh, also, I want to mention that. So I didn't mention this at the beginning, but of course, GM also has, you know, some lots of fast charging, DC fast charging programs in place as well. They have a deal for inside cities with EVgo, and then they have a, uh, a program along uh, with Pilot, the, the truck stops. So to have like interstate routes as well, so yeah. they're, they're doing those all those things as well. So you know they're just scattergun approach, which is good. I just right, and I did like Tom that you mentioned that the uh, their onboard charging thing. So I believe now that all the Altium platforms are at least at least optional, if not standard equipment, up to nineteen point two kilowatts. So that is. Uh, that is why because <laughs> that's 19.2 kilowatt 80 amp charging that's that's high for ac charging we don't really usually see that in the wild too much you know and a lot of most people can't take advantage of that mm -hmm. but uh they will in the future well, we think some of the newer cars seem yeah. to be coming out with with higher with more powerful onboard charges if you remember tesla mm -hmm. offered it back in the early uh model s days but then they they pulled back and and dropped the, all their vehicles down to to a, a 48 amp onboard charger. So that might come back now that we have bigger, bigger and bigger batteries are coming. Uh, you know, the, the we're, we're starting to see the 80 amp onboard chargers. Hey, Kyle, did you, how, did you want to weigh in on this AC charger? Thing? I think it's great. 80 amp, 80 amp charging is great flow consistently seems to make very reliable, very robust charging hardware, yeah. uh, optimized for very cold temperatures. It all it's seems Canadian. good to me. I think mm. that these chargers are going to help the car dealerships more than anything else. Although News Coulomb commented and said that they will be going in at places of business and community yeah. centers around town. Right. And that that's the key. That's where these things should be going. And the big thing is really, uh, you know, specking 80 amp charging, because when you start getting down to, to 48 amps, when we're talking Hummer EV, which doesn't actually even have an 80 amp onboard charger, we just did a whole pod, Brandon and Brandon Flash and I just did a whole podcast on this. But basically, big boy onboard chargers, fast AC charging can supplement quite a few DC fast charge installations. I'm just responding to uh, Brad in the comments. Maybe I'll do just do that vocally. So Brad is asking, where did it go? Is asking Brad Cook. Uh, no, that's not the one. <laughs> Scroll up some more. While you're finding it, I'll, I'll note that ah. I just installed my um, the the Ford uh, uh, Charge Station Pro. I had it on the wall here for a while now, but it wasn't hooked up. We just hooked it up last week because I powered up Intelligent Backup Power. Everything's working at my house. My service upgrade, and it it is great charging at home at 80 amps. My Lightning just fills up. You know, whereas. Okay. I know the, the the crazy thing is I went from level I was charging level one the lightning in the Rivian for a while while I had the garage all ripped apart and it was just stupid I was right, getting two yeah. miles of range per hour right. and then for a little bit I was back on the level two which was great but now that I can charge with the uh, the Charge Station Pro it's amazing how quickly the the lightning fills up at home it's really great right the level one works okay for like a spark ev but when you get the big consumers of electricity like the F yeah pickup trucks no that's not quite enough um so yeah brad brad cook had asked dom has gm released a roadmap of which dealerships will get these uh no they just like a, a thousand so far more coming there's some in the ground already in wisconsin and in michigan and they listed a few other states where there'll be uh more being begun in the new year but there's not like a, a 
you know, a complete mm. roadmap. And I'm not sure if they will actually. That's a lot of information. I think you have to look at that at the at the local level, like consult your your dealership in your in your town. Um, all right. So speaking of automakers and their dealers, 65% of Ford dealers have signed on to be Model E stores so they can sell electric vehicles. Tom, you wrote this up. Uh, maybe just give us a because we got to move along to what we've been driving. But uh, maybe give us a quick rundown of what being a Model E dealer entails and your opinion about this 65% figure. It seems like slightly lower than I had hoped for. So uh, the funny thing is, and I think I said on the podcast, I can't remember. Uh, I know I said it somewhere on live that I expected between 60 and 70% of the dealers to sign on for this. So, uh, you, you know, one of the, one of those rare times that I was pretty uh, nailed it with, uh, with as far as, you know, the uptake. And I was out at the dealer meetings in Las Vegas uh, back in September when um, Ford broke this news to the dealers. So I got a chance to talk to a whole bunch of dealers. And that's what I was noticing of the people that I was talking to. Maybe 50% were like, yeah, we're definitely going to do this. Another 20% or so was like, yeah, we're probably going to do it. And then, you know, 20 or 30% were like, yeah, no, we're, we're not going to sign on for it. Not now, at least. But just so you understand... What Ford did was they, they created Ford Model E. It's it's almost like a franchise within Ford, and that's for their 100% electric vehicles. If dealers want to sell, continue to sell 100% electric Fords, they have to sign on to be a Model E dealer. There's two levels of it. There's Model E Certified and Model E Certified Elite. If you're Certified Elite, you can sell as many EVs as you want. You have full service rights. If you just want to sign on to be Certified, you're allowed to sell a limited amount of EVs a year. I think it's 20 or 25 EVs and 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 you can and you have full service rights. Now, why wouldn't you sign up to be an elite? Because it costs more. Uh, there's stricter uh, rules on on the infrastructure that you have to sign up. If you want to sign up to be a Model E dealer, you have to install a bunch of infrastructure, high speed DC fast chargers in your parking lot that are publicly accessible, not just for your customers, that have to be available for anyone to use. And you have to maintain them. And they're linked to Ford. Ford will know when one goes down, uh, a truck's going to roll out to fix it. Um, so Ford said they're going to stay on top of that to make sure they are all working. Um, and there's a lot of other things they have to do. They have transparent pricing. The dealers have to post on Ford's website, not their own personal website, what the what what like say an F-150 Lightning or another electric vehicle costs. They will be set pricing. It's not like they can set, change the prices set pricing. They'll be able to change them every now and then, but it's not like a daily thing. And what, the good thing about that is if you're interested in getting an electric Ford, you can go on the Ford.com website and you can look at the four or five dealers that are in your area. And you can say, oh, this one is is, is $500 less than this one. Click and buy it. You, you order it, buy it on the website. And if you don't even want to go to the dealership, you don't have to. You can select to have it delivered to your house and you can, you, you can choose to never even go to the, the dealership. And whenever you need service, you can also have them pick up and drop off your vehicle. So you Ford, the way this is set up with Model E, you can literally never go to a dealership if you don't want to. But of can course, they, if you want to, you can. Can they set their own pricing higher? So if they've, if they've ordered a, an interesting spec in the co exact colors that you want, they can put two, three, five grand on that and, and you pay a premium because you can't get another one like it? The, the, the dealer gets to choose the pricing. This goes back fine. to the dealer franchise laws here in the U.S. Ford can't break that. It's, oh, it's, fine, it's, it's, it's They can't get over that. But but um, th there is set pricing that is on that is on the Ford website. And the, once they set that, they can't change it. Well, the, I'm sure they'd be allowed to, but there's going to be rules on, on how frequently. Mm. But it allows customers to have transparent pricing Click on that one. And what that's going to do is it's going to keep the prices lower, Martin, because yeah. if if you have inventory and the dealer three miles away has basically the same inventory, you, you can't be $2,000 more than this guy. You won't sell any vehicles. So the dealers are going to be constantly checking to make sure they're in line. Is it perfect? No. But is this Nothing. the best step towards uh, set you know, um, uh, you know, almost cutting out the dealership that Ford could legally do. I think it is. And uh, the, the execution is going to be big here. Let's see how they execute. Everything looks great on paper, but we don't right. know if it's going to be executed the way it is. So getting back to the percentages. So about 65% of the dealers in the country signed up for it. There's like 2,960 eight dealers in the U S um, so, so will you say, well, then 35% of the dealers said, no, I don't want this. 
So this, this to sign on for this, it begins January 1st, 2024. So everyone could sell Electric Forge for another year. January 1st, 2024 to January 1st, 2027, for three years, only the dealers that agreed to do it now can sell EVs. Those other dealers cannot sell a single electric, uh, fully electric Ford. They can Man. sell plug-in hybrids. Um, but then in 2025, the dealers that haven't signed on are going to be asked, do you want to be a Ford Model E dealer? They can then opt in to either section. And then January 1st, 2027, the second wave goes. So the dealers that I talked to that said, you know, we're, we're, we're probably going to pass on this. They weren't like, we hate EVs. We're not going to sell EVs. This is, you know, what they were saying was, look, we, we our dealership's in really rural areas of the country. Right. And we, we sell like, you know, a couple EVs a year. It doesn't, it's not worth me putting this huge investment out right now. We're, we're in on EVs. We'll sell you whatever you want to buy. But, but for us to drop a million dollars now and put in charging infrastructure, buy all the stuff and everything, and then we sell, you know, a, a 20 or 30 EVs a year for the next year or two, um, we don't think that that's uh, the right decision. So we're going to wait until we're gonna, we'll probably end up signing on in 2025. And then we'll on in 2027, we'll be able to sell the cars. And you know what? Maybe by then the, the equipment will be even better. We'll get like the latest DC fast chargers and, and, you know, we'll let these dealers learn, like make the mistakes and everything. And then that next wave Ford will have this all ironed out and it'll, and it'll be, um you know, it'll be a better transition for us. So that's what I think you're saying. Right. Um, Sorry to take so long. I know you want to, no, okay. Quick. but this is you... big news in my opinion. Right. Yeah, it is. It's an interesting way of approaching the, the ad adopting the, the dealership model for, for the electric age or for just, yeah, because I mean, Tesla turned everything on its head really with, with, with their direct sales. And, and so this is, you know, a way of, yeah. I don't know, just and advancing the dealership model, keeping the dealership model, but just making it better. And one last thing I want to add, if Ford does, successfully roll this out if the you know the devil's always in the details if things work out the way they plan them to and people can have drop off and pick up service they have a mobile service too where, where they're going to fix the deals will fix a lot of the vehicles in your driveway if they can't pick if they can't pick it up drop it off if it works you can guarantee gm and and dodge uh, dodge chrysler are, are going to have the same model uh, you know with, within a few years because ford's going to have such a competitive advantage over them yeah, I mean, yeah, I guess we'll have to see for sure, but yeah, it makes sense. Um, all right, so do you want to talk about what we've been driving this week? Yes, okay. So, Kyle, uh, let's talk about, so I'm not sure, I did go through all, I'm not sure what you have this week that you want to talk about, but I did see you had a video on your Tesla Model 3 performance. Uh, your rally mode has been engaged, and you've installed the Mountain Pass performance coilovers and lift kit on your lift kit i just want to say that again because you're putting this on a model 3 performance which is not what you'd expect to have a lift kit on so yeah how did it go uh yeah the install was i think uh timon did it completely wrong which was hilarious so we you know just went through everything sure. backwards it took way longer than we thought but yeah i mean we're the car's pretty much done i actually pick it up today it was just dropped off for a realignment of course when you change right. every suspension component every bearing every bushing's been replaced uh you know we gotta get those wheels back in line and then we can start playing around with the heights and then we get it realigned. So I haven't done a full shakedown, a full review. Um, but I thought, hey, well, we're in Colorado. We have some of the best roads around here. We actually have a winter rally circuit that, uh, you know, just general enthusiasts can enter into. And I thought this would be the perfect car to build for a little snow rally. Yeah. Get it out there with the Subaru STIs and the Evos and do, a, you know, bring electric to a new type of sport. And so we decided to go with the Mountain Pass Performance uh, full comfort adjustable coilover kit. So it's really nice and soft, plus the lift. Then we disconnected the sway bars. So the whole thing leans over like a rally car, picks up the inside wheel going around roundabouts. It's really awesome. And here's time in doing the install completely wrong, of course. Uh, but, you know, it's all done now for the most part. The car is uh, put back together and now it's time to go send it. So I can't wait to go drive it figure out what it's like it's going to be really comfortable for road trips that's going to be the best part is this thing's just going to glide everywhere uh, we'll probably reconnect the front sway bar for road trips though because it is a little soft uh without it but for dirt and snow it's perfect we want those tires on the ground 
and should be really kind of fun. So enjoying it. Love playing around with stuff. Love tinkering. Going to start working on upgrading the Model S next because the suspension needs a little love. Too much compliance, too much deflection in the bushings in that car. So all all part of the fun. Wow. Uh, that your uh, your pod is going to be a monster. It's already a monster. This like uh, it can it can you put big brakes on it so it can stop as well as as go. It goes super well. Um, so how how much so this this car your Model Three performance has like a lot of miles. I put eighty five hundred miles on it myself. Uh, it's close to what one hundred and twenty thousand miles now. Yeah, I think we're going to tick over one hundred and twenty by the end of uh, next week once we start getting some miles on it. Then it's out of warranty, uh, which is uh, will be an interesting situation to run one of these. I mean, the big thing is most there's a lot of Model Threes that are out of battery and motor warranty. Very few of them have been driven as hard as this car and have been supercharged as much as this car. And there are definitely examples out there. So I'm not worried about it, but it'll make for good content if we need to end up replacing a battery pack or replacing a motor. But this car is going strong. It's showing no signs of giving up. The motors feel brand new and uh, just amazing how overbuilt the drivetrain is on this car. But the suspension was a pr pretty pretty much finished it but but before you replace it I, I don't know if you had a chance to check out the bushings that were in there it was they were they... actually totally fine the okay. only issue was the upper control arm bolt is notorious for backing out a little bit and becoming okay. loose and that's oh. the the start of the rattle that you heard honestly oh. probably a good thing you didn't drive it for another couple months because that would have backed out that's not unique to our car that's just a model right. 3 thing check your upper control arms and make sure they're torqued to spec uh, but honestly, I think if we were just to tighten that up, suspension would have been a hundred percent. Okay. So or, it wouldn't have uh, been quite within reason it, because it was kind of rattly. So now it's not rattly at all. We're driving it around. So, well, we replaced every suspension component. There's right. pretty much nothing left. So every arm, every, everything all, all done. And uh, yep, just no, no but, noises. So it feels like a new car basically. Yeah. It essentially got a new lease on life. Sweet. And then, you know, really the only indication that it's kind of an old car because the interior still looks brand new. There's no issues there are some, you know, of, of course, it's got some dents and scrapes, but it's really the battery degradation is the only, I would say, drawback to the car. And it's only lost about 10 percent or so, uh, which really isn't bad. Right. When you hit 120,000 miles, it would be cool if you did a zero to 100 percent supercharger session to see how many kilowatt hour get pumped, get added back. Yeah, so I did all that at um, 100,000 miles. I did a full degradation test because the day I got the car, I drove it from 100 till it stopped and looked at how many kilowatt hours I could pull out of it. Then did the same thing later. So we we I have, I've also run Teslify on the car since before I pulled it out of the the delivery center's parking lot. So literally every mile has been logged, has been tracked, every use on this car. And it's been wonderful to have all the data. I wish more cars had something like Tesla Fire, one of these Tesla apps out there, because just logging in and seeing every charging session, every curve of every charging session, it's unbelievable. Wow. Nice. Uh, so what, what else? Have you have driving anything else this week, Kyle? Anything else, videos that you want to talk about? Uh, yeah, so we have some going next week. I can't talk about yet. Okay. But yeah, drove, drove the Model S a lot this week. We have our e-trons going in to get blacked out. A lot of good stuff going on. Nothing that I think we really need to talk too much about. Okay. I saw uh, Max. You had a, a video with Max talking about the BMW i3 as a used car. Right. Well, we're buying a, a under $25,000 EV to fit within this new tax right. used car credit. Mm -hmm. And we wanted to drive all of the options. So right. that's kind of where we are on that. Okay. I was looking at used cars, EVs last night, actually. And I, you know what? I came this close to buying another Spark EV. <laughs> why would you do that oh. because i because there's i one give up for, there's a, there's a 2016 with like seven thousand miles out there that i can get for right around nine thousand dollars dominic there's no such thing as the right deal on the wrong car you got to get the car that fits your needs you need to go on trips right i know i'm, I'm looking and just like but in the used used evs they're still all man Honestly, you can get a model three rear wheel drive now for under 30 grand multiple options under 30 grand yeah i mean yeah. it'd be a matter of the miles i'm i'm kind of averse to buying something with like a lot of miles on it but right, it's electric who cares I, yeah I, that's true it's less important for sure model 3 is proven to just run forever yeah 
Oh, people. Nathan Green says, "Just say no, Dom." Okay, no more Spark EVs for me then. But it's a great deal for whoever whoever wants like a, a fun little car to drive. Uh, yeah, I just I just saw the deal there and was like, it just stood out amongst all the other things I was looking at. Mostly 2012 Leaves. There's so many 2012 Leaves on the market. Well, that's and, the nicest car on the planet. <laughs> and people want a lot of money for some of them. You know, it was like not even like the. The so newer ones, yeah, the 2016s. I think you got to get 2016 to get to the bigger batteries. But man, people are proud of their leaves. I tell you, yes, they're wonderful. <laughs> Truly, a fine piece of handmade craftsmanship. Right. All right. Uh, so, Tom, uh, you have a couple of videos this week. So, you had one. Well, let's just talk about this other one first. So, Ford rolled out phone as a key update for early Lightning owners and so you did a, a whole video on how to install phone as a key on your f1 give us a little bit of background about this yeah so when the lightning first came out the phone as a key option wasn't available ford didn't have the it fully baked yet they started adding it to all the vehicles built at the end of july somewhere around july 22nd or 3rd somewhere after that all the new lightnings that had the option. It's not standard on all lightnings. You had to have the packet, either the extended range battery pack or a Lariat or pro, uh, Platinum uh, with the convenience package or, or the, the the tech package. So th there was, not everybody had it, but I, my, I should have gotten it. So all the, the lightnings between April and the end of July that was supposed to get it, didn't get it. So I had been constantly pinging forward about this. When is this update going to come? And they just kept saying soon, soon, soon. I don't understand why it was taking so long because all the new vehicles have had it since the end of July. So they finally pushed it out. And uh, a lot of Ford uh, Lightning owners in the forums have been asking for it. So I said, you know what? Let me just do a quick um, uh, a quick video of me downloading the downloading it onto my Ford Pass app and, and enabling it and, and seeing if it worked. And uh, everything works except walk away lock, which is kind of a big thing that hmm. doesn't work. And I found out I wasn't really aware it doesn't work. It, it, it doesn't work. I don't think on the Mustang Mach-E either at this point. So like Ford just can't figure out how to get walk away lock, which is a big part of using your phone as a key. Phone as a key means you don't need to carry the key fob. You walk up to your vehicle. You, you, you know, you wake your phone up and the doors open and, and when you leave, you just turn it off and walk away and it automatically locks. So as it is now, it will open the, the, the truck for me. So I don't need my key fob, but when I'm walking away, I do have to open up my Ford Pass app and hit lock if I don't have my key fob to lock it. So it's kind of, it's still half baked. Um, mm. and now I'm finding out on the forums that on the 2023 lightning, it's not even available, right? I see Kyle shaking his head. They've removed it. So um, I'm going to get some clarity from Ford on this next week. I'm actually going out to Detroit to spend some time with Ford. Um, and I'm going to try to get some clarity on what's why why has it been removed uh, from the 2023 Lightnings. So, but uh, I mean, it, it kind of half works now. <laughs> mm. So Walkaway does lock on the Maki. I was wrong with that. Um, but it does not work on the Lightning, either the early Lightnings that I had or the later lightnings where it came out of the factory with that option. Um, it, it walk away lock does not work. That's weird. You can get it to work yeah, on the, on one car, but you can't the other. That's yeah. I don't know. Yeah. That'd be great to see what, what's up with that. What, what, why? Is... Well, and when you do download it, it did, it did give you a warning that this, this, this uh, feature is not fully functional and that we're working on to complete all the, uh, so they did let you know. And when I, in my video, you'll see me, I'm like, well, I, I wonder what doesn't work on it. And then I found out at the end of the video, I was like, yeah, it's, as I walk away, it's not locking the truck. And I thought maybe I had to reinstall it, but that wasn't the case. It just, it doesn't work. <laughs> right. I mean, that's, that's a feature I really enjoyed when I had uh, Kyle's uh, Tesla. I was like, just walk away from the car and it's yeah. going to be all right. It's going to take care of itself. Yeah. I got so used to it with my model three, you know, yeah. and, and, uh, now with the Rivian, it, it works, you know, but, uh, not with, uh, not with the lightning. Right on. I even forget the lightning. There's a physical button to turn it off, you know, but with, with, with the Rivian and my, my model three previously, you know, you just get out of the vehicle, walk away and it shuts off. And I've left my Rivian, my uh, lightning on, uh, uh, plenty of times. Cause I just forget to turn it off. That's something that should go away. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so you also put a, a video this week called how to safely charge your electric vehicle, which sounds pretty basic, you know, to some of us, I'm sure, but 
I don't know what, what's what's the deal with that. Was it yeah, super so basic or is it, what's just going put on? it out last night? Uh, you know, a lot of it is common sense, but there's a, a lot of things. It's, what's common sense to the four of us isn't common right. sense to a new electric vehicle owner. You know, and and um, the, it's it was kind of a, a follow up video to Sandy Monroe put out a video about like a month and a half ago, and it was on uh, charging home charging safety and how. So many people are reporting failures on their NEMA 1450 outlets and junction boxes melting and, and fires. You know, the, the, this does happen. So um, I watched it and I was like, yeah, this is good. This was really informative. I'm glad he did it. But the funny thing is, w the first day I got like 25 emails and messages from my followers saying, hey, Tom, did you see this? I'm really worried about this. I use an NEMA 1450. Um, you know, I, I had an electrician in, 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 in install this and uh, I'm worried about it now. And uh, you guys can remember a month or so ago, Kyle posted uh, a picture here of, uh, you know, uh, he had a juncture box that melted on him. So this is happening. And uh, right. so scary. I felt like I needed to do a follow up because so many of my followers within the first week, I counted over 50 emails that I got and messages of people saying, Tom, could you please do a follow up on this? You know, we trust Sandy, but we do trust you about charging and would like to hear your comments on it. So what, while I was doing the home, my whole home update last week that you guys saw at the end of the show, I had my channel sponsor, Q Merit. I had one of their like lead guys here. And I said, would you sit down at a table with me and just uh, let's do a Q and A. And then I'm going to do an overview of this on some of my recommendations. And he said, sure. So we sat down and we talked about it. And you know, one of the things I liked what Sandy, Sandy had an electrician on and he recommended some changes to the code, which I think are great. Like, you know, having bolt on breakers, making, um, you know, equipment that is specific for electric vehicle charging right now, everything we use, the connectors, the, 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 the NEMA 1450 outlets, it's, it, it's all, you know, you safety certified and all this stuff, but honestly, EV charging is different than anything else that homeowners have ever needed in their house. It's different than air conditioning. It's different than pool pumps. It's different than welding because the, the duty cycle of EV charging is so much more severe than any other electrical appliance. Even these plugs and outlets that have been rated to handle it can't handle it because mm -hmm. they're being asked to do more than what they were designed to do. And I know that's surprising. You would think, oh, a 50 amp outlet should be able to pump 50, you know, 50 amps through it continuously 24-7. Right. Guys, that's not how it works. Yep. They're not designed for that kind of duty cycle. Those These outlets are designed for your electric range that you use an hour a day or for your clothes dryer that you use two hours uh, a week or, you know, so. Mm -hmm. And now we're, we're pumping max current through them for eight, nine hours a day sometimes seven days a week and they're, they're failing. So we did a charger safety video at the end of this video. I have a whole list of things that I recommend you do for home charging, whether you're charging on 120 volt, because a lot of people do charge on 120 volt. Um, and, and that's what Simo just pointed there uh, up on the screen, Tom, the summer at the end was informative. So I just kind of go through a checklist of the things you can do. And, and one of the things I do talk about is, is, is that honestly, please don't install your own home charging equipment. I know a lot mm. of people do. I'm a do-it-yourselfer. There's so many things I've done around my house that instead of hiring a professional, when I owned my restaurant, if I didn't do things myself, I would have went out of business. I used to fix, fix my own ovens and change pilot lights and everything because it's so expensive. Right. But this is a, kind of like a one-time expense, guys. And you're going out and buying an expensive car. Get the right professional to do it right the first time. And you can sleep well at night. So many of these things, problems we're seeing now could develop into, they could be deadly problems and get, get, get an, get, get an installer, an electrician that really is, 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 is a, an EV charging specialist, honestly, because the, the, any electrician can pull a permit and do this, but we all know there's some that uh, of tradesmen that are great at their trade. There's some that are mediocre and there's some that use the cheapest stuff because they want to have the biggest profit margin. If you get somebody that really knows EV charging, they know what this is going to be put under and they understand it because it's what they do all the time. And um, they, they'll be more likely to use copper wire rather than aluminum. You notice, take a look at Sandy's video and I'm surprised Sandy didn't bring this up. During oh. his whole video, he showed five or six things that melted. Every single one of those things had aluminum wires attached to it. Oh. But we're still using aluminum wires on electric vehicle charging. Aluminum is softer. It bends right. easier. It breaks easier. And it expands and contracts more than copper. And right. when you're pulling max current through something many hours, imagine your garage 
in the winter, if you live in a cold weather, weather area, it could be 30 or 40 degrees in your garage. So that outlet is 30 or 40 degrees. Now you plug in your charger equipment, you charge for seven or eight hours. The connections are getting up over 100 degrees Fahrenheit. And then at the end of the charging cycle, it goes back down to 30 degrees. Then it goes to 100 degrees and 30 degrees every day. The screws will literally back out of the connections over yeah. time. And then you get arcing and then you get a fire. So, I mean, there's, there's a lot of things that we could be doing to make sure your, your, your home charging equipment is safe. Just do it right, guys. Nobody, none of us want to see any of you guys have a problem at your house. Spend a few more bucks and just get it done right. And, and, and you won't have to worry about this. <clears throat> we, we outlawed that in the 1980s. We have copper cable. I mean, we run 240 volt, but like that, I'm so surprised to hear that. I didn't realize that about American wire, wiring. I, I, I see 48 amp Tesla wall connectors with wired with aluminum wire. And, 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 and the electrician goes in and half the time doesn't torque them to manufacture specs. Those in, 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 in a few months, the connections are already loose. So, yeah. you know, there's, I have a lot of recommendations at the end. And if you are using uh, NEMA 1450 or 650 outlets, if you're using plug-in outlets, one of the things I also recommend is hard, hardwire your charging equipment. It's, it eliminates one point of failure. Um, but but even if you do want to have a NEMA 1450, uh, every six or eight months, shut your circuit breaker off, pull the thing open, just take a look at it. And, and just test the connections, make sure they're not getting loose. You might see um, discoloration. You might, then you know you're starting to have a problem. Just inspect this stuff. And, uh, right. and, and it's, just, it's just best practice. It might, be, it might be worth it for some people to have an electrician come over and actually do, a, do an inspection because some people aren't comfortable, comfortable poking around in, in the- 100%. If you're not comfortable, have an electrician come and, and, and do it. And if you do want to charge 120, please, Th th that this is a no brainer. Have an electrician come and pull a dedicated 20 amp new 120 volt uh, outlet. Um, because most 100, most of your outlets in your garage are in shared circuits, your lights, your garage door opener. And, and a lot of these outlets have never been used. Like you, a lot of people don't use their outlets in their garage. The house might be 30, 40 years old and it gets very little use. Now all of a sudden you're plugging in every day and pulling the max current that the outlet can do for all night, 10, 12 hours. Just right. spend a few hundred bucks and have a dedicated new 120 volt outlet, new wiring and everything done. All this stuff, guys, is 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 your best interest. I know I'm asking you to spend your own money on it, but it's in your best interest. We've seen so many problems. We're past our time, but Adam K had a good comment here. Would you guys recommend reducing the amps that a car requests as a mitigation tool, as long as it's enough to charge to the level you need daily? Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. If 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 if. It, it, Ch ch charge as slow as necessary, you know, it, it, okay. or charge only as fast as necessary. Okay. You know, it, it, yeah. if you don't need the miles, charge slow. It's it, it, it won't. It's not bad for your battery. Greg Cam Greg Kramer echoes you in the comments here too. He says, "Very, I'm a retired electrical engineer, and all this is all legit for sure. If unsure, derate it yourself. Do not use it at max current until it's checked out." Yeah. All right. So I think that brings us to the end of our show. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, you can leave them on the Inside EVs forum podcast thread or on our YouTube or Twitch comment sections. If you like the show, please give us a thumbs up if you're watching us on YouTube. Uh, don't forget you can find and follow our panelists on Twitter. Follow Tom Mologny at Tomolog, that's with two M's. Martin Lee is at EV News Daily. Kyle Connor is at It's Kyle Connor. Just click subscribe and tap that bell icon for notifications. And we'll see you all again next week. Thanks for joining us. Ciao.